today as we come to the table. No, honey, you can't see that movie, although all your friends are. Oh, Dad, that's painful. You're really cutting away a part of the flesh that I like and I want to be a part of. All my friends get to have that flesh. How come I can't? Because we're going to walk blameless before God. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when we come to our kids with that, rather than rebellion, that's not fair. I don't think this. If they see God in our life, if they see that we're walking holy, you know what our kids are going to do? All right, Dad, go ahead. We're with you on this one. Amazing. But guys, that's the testimony that Abraham had with his family. And dads, really, that's the testimony that we need to have. Our children are watching us way more than we realize. It's not just what you say directly to them in those rare moments you find to offer them life advice. They hear every word that comes out of your mouth and see every little thing you do or don't do, even if it seems like they're not paying attention. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, as Pastor Mark continues our study of the book of Genesis, he'll challenge us to be God-focused parents. Make God a priority for the sake of your own soul, as well as your kids. You can't choose for them or make them follow Jesus. But if they see you doing it faithfully, they're much more likely to follow. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 17 with today's edition of Come to the Table. people today that think because they go and do all the things they're supposed to do, you know, go through confirmation class or, you know, get baptized and, and do all the things they're supposed to do. Somehow now they're right with God. No, it doesn't work that way. Being right with God only comes through a heart commitment to God, a repentance of sin and receiving Christ as Lord. That's what is, it is being right with God. God doesn't want our flesh circumcised. He wants our heart circumcised. It says in Deuteronomy 10, 16, the Lord speaking to the nation of Israel he said, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and do not be stiff-necked. You know that stiff neck, you know, of, of, of the horse that won't, you know, go when you want him to go and he's pulling against you? He says, don't be stiff-necked like that. He says, circumcise your heart. Make your heart, cut away the fleshy areas in your life. Make your heart right before me. And so that I can be, that you can be clean. And again, it's the same thing with these two signs. It's a sign of cutting away the flesh and baptism, a sign of washing away the old person, washing away the filth of the world, but showing an inward thing that has taken place. And so again, he's, he's saying, you know, this is what I have for you, Abraham. And again, although Abraham being probably surprised by this, we're going to see that he's very obedient and he wants everything to be given over to the Lord. Notice he says here, uh, he says in verse 11, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your four sins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generation. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any stranger who is not your descendant. In other words, anyone you're connected with that wants to be a part of your spiritual family, Abraham, they've got to be circumcised. And what's the, the symbolism here is very clear to us, and that is simply this. Is, is, it is simply a sign of something that God is doing on the inner heart. God's promise is not simply to the descendants of Abraham and those who receive circumcision as a Jew, but he's saying anybody that will be a part of your spiritual family, they need to be circumcised. And again, the picture is that circumcision of the heart, that cutting away of the flesh, being a child of God, repenting of our sins and being a part of the family of God. You know, it's interesting to me that he asked him to do it on the eighth day. Now, there is a very practical reason for that. And this amazes me about God. I love the way God does things. Because even again, I've known this for a long time, but I found out something new this week that even makes it more exciting. You see, a baby's blood clotting factors are not kicked into gear until the eighth day. 
they begin to generate before that, but all the things there that, you know, the, the, the vitamin K that needs to be there and, and the other, you know, factor there in the blood that makes it uh, coagulate is not in place until the eighth day. And so it's, it, we see God's fingerprint here, God's hand. People say, oh yeah, God wrote the Bible, prove it. There's stuff like this all through the word of God where God chose the very first day that we now know medically is possible for a baby to be circumcised and not be a free bleeder. But what's even more exciting to me about this, as I was looking into this this week and read this particular medical article that says that on the eighth day, all male children, for some reason, their blood clotting levels spike 10%. And on day nine, they go back down to normal. Is that not exciting? Again, the fingerprint of God, the handprint of God in the Word. If you ever doubt God's Word is God's Word, things like this should just throw the doubt out the window. I had an anesthesiologist come up to me after the first service. And I've got to share this with you because it goes in line with just God's amazing foresight and insight in the way He's going to deal with us. God knowing that He would do this, that there would be circumcision and designing in the body, that there would be this blood clotting on the eighth day and that it would spike on the eighth day. He said, you know, it's interesting. There's been an enzyme known to man that has been completely dormant and was never used throughout history. It was just in the human body and no one knew why it was there. He said, and we found out when we got into the age of anesthesiology that in order for your body to do away with the anesthesiology and come out of the, the, uh, the sleep that they put you under, it takes that enzyme. And God foreordained before the foundation of the earth to put an enzyme in our body that wouldn't even be needed until our generation because he knew there would be surgeries that would be done and we would need to come out of this anesthesia. Is this not a great God who plans ahead or what? No other purpose for that enzyme, no other reason for it to even be in the body. And God says on the eighth day, there's this blood clotting factor. I want you to do it on the eighth day. But the most significant thing about the eighth day is that the number eight in scripture is the number of new beginnings. Is that not exciting? You see, what a beautiful picture of the new beginning we have in Jesus when we cut away the flesh from our life and choose to follow him. And some of you may do that for the first time today. You see, you can be spiritually circumcised today by confessing your sin, asking Jesus to forgive you, repenting of your sin, receiving him as Lord and Savior in your life. And the Bible says you now have a new beginning. You're a new creation. All the old passes away and you are born again. Isn't that interesting? Born one time and now born again, uh, symbolically on the eighth day here of a baby, but in a very real way for us in spirit. Well, notice he goes on and says, he who is born in your house and who is bought with your money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Notice what the Lord says. If anyone refuses to cut away the flesh, they cannot be one of mine. And that is true for us today. If any of us say, I will not give that sin up, I will not turn from what I know is wrong. I will not cut away the flesh in that area of my life. God says, if you do that, you cannot be a part of me, nor a part of my family, nor a part of salvation, nor a part of the eternal kingdom. Pretty radical. But then again, that's the God we serve, isn't it? He forces us to one side or the other. You're with me or you're against me. He says, if they won't do it, Abraham, they're not a part of my family. And the message for us today is anyone that will not repent of their sin and cut it out of their life, they can never be a part of my family. How many people think they can live in their sin and come to church each week and God's gonna accept them? They're deceived. God says, if you don't cut it away, you're not a part of my family, nor can you be in my family. Powerful. And again, but secondly, notice here, Abraham's family said if they're not circumcised, again, they'll, they'll be cut off. And again, he's speaking not only physically, but spiritually as he addresses this issue here. But then notice he goes on and he says in verse 15, then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, she shall not, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So now he says, I'm not only gonna change your name, I'm changing Sarah's name. I not only have a plan for your life, Abraham, I have a plan for Sarah's. And so again, notice what he's gonna do in Sarah's life. He says, and I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Note that, not by Hagar, not by your own scheming, not by your own means. I am El Shaddai. I'm the Almighty. I'm gonna do an amazing miracle in your life so that you can see and so that you can believe. It'll be a son by her and then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. And again, many say that Sarah's name signifies that. Sarai meaning princess. Sarah also meaning princess because the root words are the same. But some say that Sarah comes with the meaning of also a woman of nobility. And so not only will she be a princess before me, she's gonna be a woman of nobility having kings come from her line. And so again, God making his promise to both of them here and showing his blessing on both of them. She herself will have a baby 
Notice he says, then Abram fell on his face and he laughed. I mean, you can imagine. And he said, his heart shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? You know, just a year from now, I'll have it. And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Now, it's interesting. His laughter here, in Romans, it tells us it was not a laughter of disbelief, but a laughter of joy. God, you're amazing. This is incredible. And yet when he tells Sarah, we're going to find out she doesn't really believe. Because sometime later, when the, when the Lord actually comes with two angels and he's there talking with Abraham, Sarah's listening through the tent. We'll see that episode shortly. He says, Sarah's going to have a baby. She laughs. But she laughs in her heart. So they both laughed. His was a laughter of belief and joy. Hers was a laughter of unbelief. And you know you've got both type hearts, don't you? But the good news is both of them ended up repenting and committing to the Lord, both Abram and Sarah. And so it depends on the type of laughter we have, our standing with the Lord. Do we laugh and believe in God's greatness or do we laugh in scorn that God couldn't do it? You see, in the natural realm, this was impossible. But in the supernatural realm, Abraham needed to learn that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with El Shaddai. And now it hits him. He laughs. Oh, child, I can't believe it. Oh, through, through Sarah, this is incredible. And then, oh, wait a minute. She's really old. And, I, and I'm really old. And, and, we're, and, and I mean, I appreciate the miracle and all, but like, what about, we, we have a child, Ishmael. No, Ishmael was done by the work of the flesh. And the work that I'm going to do is going to be a work of the spirit. But notice he tries that. And Abram said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. You know, I've got one. Let's just kind of, Lord, bless him. Let's just kind of take what's already there and let you work in that. And, and again, I can imagine him thinking, man, this is just too much. You know, let's, just, let's just go with the whole Ishmael route. But notice then God said, no, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. So not only a son, but I've given you the name. It's interesting. Guess what Isaac means? Laughter. Isn't that interesting? I'm going to give you a son. And you know what you just did? Yeah, yeah, that's his name. You know what I told you? <laughs> okay, that's his name. Laughter. And no doubt he brought much laughter over all the years that they had him. Much joy. And so his name is actually going to be laughter. So God tells him the name that it's going to be. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. So again, God's showing very clearly that it's through Isaac the line is blessed, and it's not through Ishmael as far as the, the land, as far as the promise that's given there. And again, that's why there's so much contention in the Middle East. And God makes it very clear, no, this is to your line. But now note this, God is not going to leave Ishmael out in the cold. He knows Abram loves him, and God loves him as well. Notice verse 20, and as for Ishmael, that is the father of the Arab peoples, I've heard you, uh, behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. You know, a lot of people feel like, well, you know, that maybe God left out the, the Arab peoples because his promise is with, you know, the Jewish people. But wait a minute. God loves all of us on the earth. He specifically just chose the Jewish people to pass down this promise and this blessing through. And to think that God hasn't blessed the Arab peoples. Let me ask you this. Where the Arab peoples live and where God has placed them and given them their land is some of the richest land in the world, oil-rich land. And God has said, I will bless them greatly. I'm going to give them great resources. I'm going to, I'm going to do great things in their life. You say, well, wait a minute. They do have great oil-rich resources, but why often times are they so poor and why are they not modern like we are and why does it seem so different in certain areas? And in certain areas it does. But again, the reason is because they have brought a curse on their life by rejecting the promise God gave to the Jewish people. What did he tell Abraham? For those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. The Arab peoples have turned against the Jewish people and said, we're not going to follow your God. We're not going to believe that God gave the promise through you. We're not going to listen to uh, the Messiah that, that's, that's through your, your line or whatever. And therefore, although God has blessed them, they have a curse on their life as well. And so you have a mix of blessing and cursing. God desires to richly bless them. But until they repent, he can't pour out his blessing the way he desires. Notice he goes on, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Now notice this set time next year. It is interesting because now he reveals to Abraham, there is a specific time on my calendar when I will bring my promise to pass. We need to hear that, don't we? Sometimes we think, Lord, the promise is never going to happen. I've been waiting forever. When is it going to happen? Lord, when are you going to do it? It's like, come on. No, relax, Mark. There's a set time. You just be faithful. You'll be up. Don't rebel, which can delay it. If you rebel, you'll delay my blessings. But walk with me blameless. And at the set time, I will bring to pass what I have promised to bring to pass. There are rewards for those who are faithful to the Lord. And so God's telling Abram, look, there's a set time. Don't worry about it. It's going to happen in my specific set time. You'll know it when it happens. And he tells him, he says, it's this time next year. 
And then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. So Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all who were born in his household, and all who were brought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins. Note this, I have this underlined, that very same day, as God had said to him. Now note this, God didn't tell him it had to be that day. God told him to do it that day. But the Bible doesn't say that God said he had to do it that day. Do you follow me? Notice the heart of Abraham. Notice what this reveals about Abraham. Abraham said, I'm not only going to be obedient, I'm going to be obedient right now. And I'm going to be obedient the moment God reveals to me to be obedient. What a witness that is to us. Let me ask you, is God convicting your heart of something right now that you need to circumcise out of your life? Is God showing you something right now that you need to cut it out? God has said, cut it out. That's enough. You know that's sin. You know it's against me. You know you're going the wrong way. It's time to turn from it. And you're saying, yes, I know that. I feel the conviction. And a little bit later, I'll take care of it. Not Abraham. Abraham said, Lord, you tell me to do it. I'm doing it right now. Would to God that we had the heart of Abraham. I love the story of Charles Spurgeon. I've shared it with you before where he's walking with a group of people and all of a sudden they realize he wasn't with them. And they stop. Where's, you know, where, where's, where's Chuck? You know, where's Charles Spurgeon? They turn around and he's back there on the sidewalk way behind them standing there with his head bowed. And they all go back to him and say, what are you doing? We're, just kind of, we're all walking, we're talking, and all of a sudden you stop, and we don't even know you're gone until we're further down the road, we come back. He said, because as we were walking, God revealed to me something in my life I needed to get right, and I dare not take another step until it is. That's the heart of Abraham. Right now, do you have that heart? And listen, there's hope if you don't. You say, well, I don't have that heart. I kind of like to hang on to my sin. Then you need to go to God and say, God, change my heart. I want a heart like Abraham. I want a heart that will obey the very same day. You see, it's not just obedience that God desires. It's immediate obedience. And, and because why? That proves that we love him. If you love someone, you'll go all out to show them. And he says, I want you to be obedient immediately. Abraham is obedient immediately. And again, it shows us this wonderful heart that he has. Notice it says, and Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Again, you know, I know that Abram knew the Lord already at this point, but note this. It doesn't matter how old you are when you hear the call of God to cut the sin out of your life. It's never too late to make a decision. And there may be someone right here, as a matter of fact, today saying, you know what? I need to make a decision right now. I need to have this. God has convicted me right now, but I'm kind of old and I'm kind of set in my ways, whatever the case might be. Listen, it's never too late. Abram, 99 years old, God has told me to cut away the flesh from my heart. I'm going to cut it away and I'm going to make a serious commitment to God. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And that very same day, Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael. Note this, in verse 25, it says that he was 13. Remember we said earlier that 13 was the number of rebellion? We're going to find out that Ishmael was a rebellious child. As a matter of fact, so much so later on that he gets kicked out of the home and Ishmael has to leave. Hagar and Ishmael both. We, we will see that they mock Isaac. And even today, they often still mock, don't they? The descendants of Ishmael. What is my point? Listen, you can be raised in a Christian home and go through all the religious rituals like Ishmael did and still have a wrong heart before God. And so make sure that if you have said a prayer, but you've never truly repented and cut the flesh out of your life, that you're not deceived into thinking you're a part of the family of God when you're not. It's got to be a heart commitment. It can't be a religious ritual that you go through. Ishmael went through the ritual, but it did nothing for his heart. It's not the actions that we take on the outside. It's the actions that we take on the inside. And notice this, I love it, in verse 26, Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael. Note this, he didn't just say, Ishmael, this is something you need to do. I'm going to drop you off at church. He himself said, you know what? I'm committed to God. And I want you, son, to see my commitment. Dads, we need to let our kids see the commitment we have to God. We can't just tell our kids, you need to walk with God. We can't just tell our kids, you, don't, you shouldn't watch those things. We can't just tell our kids, you shouldn't read that. We need to not be watching those things. We need to not be reading that. We need to not be going to those internet sites. We need to make sure that we're walking with the Lord. And our kids see that and our kids know that. Abraham said, you know what? If you're going to be circumcised, I'm going to be circumcised. We're doing this father and son together. This is a family thing. I'm not going to ask you to walk holy and I'm not. We're going to walk holy as a family. And that means there may be some things that we have to get rid of. There may be some things right now in your mind you're thinking of that maybe you need to go home today and circumcise your home. There may be some movies that need to be thrown in the trash. Oh, yes, but I'm an adult. I'm over 18. After all, yeah, but is it something God would want you to do? God may be saying to your heart today, cut it out. You're planting seeds of wickedness in your heart. You're planting seeds of rebellion. You're putting images in your mind that you don't need to be fighting. You need to walk before me blameless. Do we love him enough and are we committed enough to say, you know what, Lord, whatever it takes, I'm going for it. That's the challenge that God was giving to Abraham. That's the challenge that God is giving to us today, I believe, and a challenge we need to accept. And notice lastly, I, I, this, I find this amazing. Only one verse about it. You know there had to be a huge uproar in their hearts, but notice all we get is one verse in Scripture. 
and all the men of the house. Now remember, we know there were at least 318 years ago when he went to fight against, you know, to fight for Sodom and Gomorrah to get Lot back. He had 318 trained men. How many others weren't trained? How many children were there? And how many of all the other servants, how many did he have? And now all these years have gone by. How many are there now? And notice this, all of the men of his house, not just the babies, born in the house or bought with money from a stranger were circumcised with him. Wow. It doesn't tell of any of them rebelling. It doesn't tell of anyone complaining. Now, now did they? We don't know. Was there something going on? Man, this is, oh boy. But what a testimony it is to Abraham and his witness to God for him to come to them with something so radical and then say, all right, we'll do it. See, God spoke to Abraham, not them. Picture this. Abraham goes out one day. He's going to pray. And he goes, yes, God. Okay, God. Got it, God. Gonna do it. Okay, guys, family meeting. I want all the employees in here now. Everyone that's on staff, just the men. Women, you can stay at your desk. I need to see all the men privately. What is it? What is it? God spoke to me today. Really? This is exciting. What do he say? Well, it, it's, you might not be real excited. <laughs> what is it, Abraham, that, that God said? Well, he, he said we had to do this procedure. And then he began to describe it. And I can imagine, oh. <laughs> but notice they did it. What it says is, Abraham, I, I believe that you're hearing from God. And dads, I believe that if we live a righteous life in front of our family and show them that we're seeking God, when we come to them, even with the hard things, no, honey, you can't see that movie, although all your friends are. Oh, dad, that's painful. You're really cutting away a part of the flesh that I like and I want to be a part of. All my friends get to have that flesh. How come I can't? Because we're going to walk blameless before God. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when we come to our kids with that, rather than rebellion, that's not fair. I don't think this. If they see God in our life, if they see that we're walking holy, you know what our kids are going to do? All right, Dad, go ahead. We're with you on this one. Amazing. But guys, that's the testimony that Abraham had with his family. And dads, really, that's the testimony that we need to have. If God convicts us of something, even if it's something we've been doing for a long time and never felt convicted about, and suddenly we go, you know, I think God has spoken to me about this, and I, I think this is not the best for us or for you guys. What do you mean, Dad? Well, I mean, there's some decisions we have to make. How are they going to respond? If we've been living godly in front of them, they may not like it. They may be bummed, but they're going to say, you know what? My dad's a man of God, and he loves the Lord. And I believe if he says that God spoke to him, so you know what? We're going to do it. Now, I'm not saying every child is that wonderful, but you know what? Even if they do kind of struggle with it, they're going to realize, you know what? I believe it's right. And it's going to be a testimony to our kids. He was a testimony to his family. He was a testimony to all of his witnesses, guys, or to all those that were his servants. And where does this leave us today? Here's the question. Is God convicting you of an area right now that you need to circumcise your heart in? Don't fight it. All right, Lord, I feel the conviction. I feel it. You're right. I need to deal with this. And let me say this. Pray for God to give you the heart of Abraham so that not only would you feel the conviction, but you'd say, I'm going to deal with it today. The very same day I'm going to deal. I'm not going to wait till next week. I'm not going to think about it and change my mind. I'm going to deal with it today. And if you do that, God will bless you abundantly. And you will have the heart of Abraham, a heart who not only shows that inward you have committed to the Lord, but now there's an outward sign by your actions that you have committed to the Lord. Obey his voice and let God do what he wants in your life. It's always a blessing to have you come to the table of God's word with us each and every day. Pastor Mark's been going through the book of Genesis, and there's much to learn and appreciate from this first book of the Bible. Sometimes to fully grasp something later on, you need to understand where things began. From verse 1, God made it clear that He was there all along, and He set things in motion exactly as He instructed. Isn't it neat to see that all of creation is under God's authority? That includes you. This could seem a bit intimidating, but it's actually God's way of looking out for your best interests. Once you look at it that way, you start to realize that everything in all of creation is something that God initiated with intention, and that includes you. What a great thing to come to today. If you missed any part of this message or would like to hear this one again, you can always go back and find it at thewaymedia.net. Just click on the Come to the Table tab. Another way to access these messages is by downloading the Way Media app from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. By doing this, you'll be able to take these teachings with you wherever you go. Would you like to get in touch with us? 
Our number is 865-609-1385. Once more, that's 865-609-1385. Feel free to call us with questions or to even ask for prayer. Please come back for another edition where Pastor Mark will continue his teaching through the book of Genesis. But next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary, Knoxville.